just want to say welcome everyone. Um, Dan's uh, time with us today is to work on issues about clinical reasoning, complexity, and how we help our students to progress as far as possible. And this is a result of some of the things that people wanted to hear about, and thank you all for coming today. I know we have folks who are not able to join us who are also interested, so this is going to be recorded. And so we want audience interaction, but be aware that whatever you say will be posted up for posterity, okay? Just be cognizant of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sue. All right. Well, this is fun. I go all around the country talking about this model, so it's nice to kind of talk about it at home. So I'm really appreciative of the invitation. Uh, but uh, what I would like to do is you have these little white cards on the, on, the, um, on the tables, and I'd like for you to write down what questions you've come with about clinical reasoning, critical thinking, clinical teaching. What kind of curiosities do you have, and what are some of the issues or agenda items you think I need to touch on today in our time? Because I'm pretty well prepared, but I want to make sure that I get your uh, questions answered. And uh, I'll collect those. I'll give you about three or four minutes to think about those, and I'll collect those, and we'll see if there's a pattern and whether or not the um, presentation will address those questions. And for those at home, you can write down your own questions now. like a good lunch, Bev. <laughs> Are those red peppers or apples? Red? No, I'm fine. Them. Thank you. Collect them. Collect them. Do you have a question? Write down a question. You don't have any questions. Lengthy. What? Lengthy. 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 What's a question, though? Yeah. Not a commentary. No, I don't. I gotta read it through. Okay. Edit. Edit. Thank you. Hi, Julie. Welcome. I'm asking people to write down questions they might have they want addressed. Setting the stage. Okay, I'll mix them up. Now the big challenge will be if I can read them. I could also take these and make FAQs, right? <clears throat> How can we help our students think uh, more toward, our students move toward thinking critically, using good judgment, making good decisions? The traditional nursing process seems very limited. We all need some alternatives that are really useful and understandable. How can we best promote and enhance our students' clinical reasoning skills? How can you help students with reflection? Um, how to evaluate clinical reasoning as a core component of APN practice? Whoa. How do you uh, reconcile the limited teaching resources in nursing today with what, in my opinion, is the need for labor-intensive, uh, one-on-one Socratic type uh, instruction? That's a good question. 
no question, but would like to hear about thinking in action, not just as a student, but as a faculty, to think about what I am doing, uh, change on mm, changes or revised strategy based on that. How can you measure your students? How can you m measure? Is that measured? When your students are thinking critically, how do you maybe, how do you teach a student to reason clinically? How do you see nursing process, problem solving, clinical reasoning, clinical judgment linking together? Uh, it came for review, general overview. <laughs> okay. How does using the OPT model set you to different, to different outcomes than using nursing process, Nanda, Nick, or Nock? Is it a more efficient model? Whoa, I guess so, all right. Lots of good questions. So, let me tell you a little bit my, my, my story and how I got interested in this long ago and far away. I was at the University of South Carolina as a faculty member, and at that time we had a very progressive associate dean for academic programs. Her name was Helen Erickson. I don't know if many of you know, she's written a book about modeling and role modeling, and, and uh, she was very instrumental in, in encouraging and leading the faculty in a curriculum revision, and she really stressed the fact that we needed to be futuristic in our thinking about what the curriculum of the future would be. And this was like way back in like 1985, right? 87, 90, yeah. And so the faculty, you know, like all curriculum revisions got together and they decided to uh, change the, cor the courses and the sequencing and the curriculum. And as a, as a result of that curriculum effort, they, they thought that the future rested in not so much critical thinking, but clinical reasoning. So in this new curriculum, they developed two courses called Clinical Reasoning One and Clinical Reasoning Two. And these were to be taught in the junior year and the senior year. And uh, they tasked Dr. Joanne Herman and I to, do, to teach Clinical Reasoning One. So when Joanne Herman and I got together, this was like when, 1995 maybe, 94, 95, I forget how far back, I'm old, so. Um, I got together with Joanne and I said, Joanne, what is clinical reasoning? <laughs> And she says, oh, I know what clinical reasoning is. And she was at that time very much ensconced in the North American Nursing Diagnosis Association movement, you know. And so she was pretty clear that clinical reasoning involved a lot of the same thinking process that was associated with the development of a nursing diagnosis, right? That you looked at cues, behavioral signs and symptoms, you clustered cues, you aggregated those cues, and you kind of came to a conclusion based on what are the response to a certain situation was. And so the first part of our clinical reasoning course were really, uh, and this was actually, I guess Nanda came along in 1973, uh, the North American Nursing Diagnosis Group had just a small little list of things at that time in terms of what nursing problems were. and. Um, so we spent a lot of our time teaching students how to develop nursing diagnosis based on this cue clustering and paying attention to what was happening. And so, uh, and then we also kind of got into the literature, which I'll go into a little bit, looking for what is the definition of clinical reasoning, how has clinical reasoning changed over time, where we really kind of, uh, try, we were trying to retrofit the nursing NANDA stuff into the nursing process, and it didn't seem to work very well, right? And so uh, I think that was one of the articles actually that Sue sent around about metacognition and the nursing diagnostic content model being framed by the nursing process model, being framed by the metacognition model. So interestingly enough, we were in this course with generic traditional students and RN degree completion students. And what we noticed was when we provided them case studies, they thought very differently about them. The nursing students would identify the problem and be really good about the problem and know about the problem space and do their assessments and they would work forward to a solution. Whereas the nurses with experience said, you know what, I need the patient to be here on day three, I'll work backwards. So they began with the end in mind as opposed to define the problem and move forward. 
And so that was a big aha for us in terms of how is it that you can identify a present state and also simultaneously consider the outcome you want and what is the tension that is created when you think about problems and outcomes in the same frame. And so that launched us into our development of, um, of the uh, OPT model. And so um, this is uh, what I hope to talk to you about today to explain how the OPT model provides a structure for nursing knowledge work um, and with attention to the development of clinical reasoning to discuss the critical creative systems and complexity thinking strategies that support the OP model. Because um, a long ago and far away I decided that it's not critical thinking we want to be teaching our students, it is clinical judgment and that critical thinking is a means to an end and that end is clinical judgment. So I will focus a lot on what is clinical judgment as opposed to what critical thinking is because I think many people put critical thinking in the foreground and clinical judgment in the background and I would just like you to do a little foreground background shift and think about bringing clinical judgment to the foreground being supported by critical thinking. But actually it's much more than that because it gets into creative thinking, it gets into systems thinking, and it gets into this complexity thinking in terms of people recognizing patterns around and through time. And then um, I have developed 20 questions that support clinical teaching and use of the OP model of reflective clinical reasoning. And I invite you to think about how you might use OP to promote enhanced teaching learning of clinical reasoning. And this teaching learning is a little tilde. You see that little tilde in there? Um, there is a very um, famous uh, brain uh, investigator who has uh, into coordinated dynamics in terms of how our brain thinks. And he has proposed that this tilde become a new notation for what he calls the squiggle sense. And the squiggle sense is when you have two things that are complementary. And so you'll see the squiggle sense uh, come back to uh, uh, explain some things. So uh, as Joanne and I um, kind of uh, got into dialogues and debates, because I was not I was not in the groupies of the North American Nursing Diagnosis Association. As a matter of fact, it took a lot for her to convince me that NANDA terminology and all of the mystification, I used to call it that, mystification about creating nursing language was um, useful. Uh, and some people think, you know, it's labeling people. Some people think it's, it's disrespectful. Other people think it's, it's the wave of the future in terms of nursing knowledge work. And, um, but I was converted. I really did come to understand, appreciate, and value the importance of nursing knowledge classification systems and nursing knowledge language systems. And so now I am a, an advocate as opposed to a skeptic. And uh, it is crucial to our future in terms of uh, knowledge building and knowledge modeling and nursing. And, and the thing that sort of helped me move the whole notion about clinical reasoning along was this 1995 definition of a nursing as the diagnosis and treatment of human responses to actual or potential health problems. I love that definition. I love that definition. Unfortunately, it got changed in 2003, got a little more complex. We're still um, diagnosing and treating human responses uh, uh, of um, individuals, families, and groups, and it's gotten more complex. But um, the notion here is it's the response to a situation which nurses diagnose and treat, right? It's not the situation itself, and that will become important because when we start talking about pathological physiological conditions, that it's the human responses to those pathophysiological conditions which is the domain and purview of nursing. And it will become important in terms of the way you begin to think about framing situations. So this is really important, this notion of framing, because I think um, frames really give meaning to a set of facts and they make very complicated things understandable. Right? So if I said birthday party, you all have a frame of what that birthday party would be like, right? And uh, it is my um, belief that 
uh, frames um, are crucial and it becomes important for us to become conscious of the way we frame things as opposed to unconscious. And I think what happens in nursing education context is that people are often unconscious of the frames they use when they're teaching students about nursing care and nursing situations. And so frames are the lenses that kind of you can look through. They are mental models, they're conceptual hooks, they're values and experience, they are theories and procedures, they, are sh they shape the outcomes that you think about, uh, they provide the content for thinking and reasoning. And so, um, there, here's some examples of framing. If you travel around the world, people frame nursing care in terms of Virginia Henderson's definition of nursing, and that's how they approach situations. Um, there are many nurse educators who I believe frame everything in pathophysiological disease processes. And that's what they teach, that's how they frame. And especially given the context of your practice, if you're working in an ER or critical care or cardiac care, you're really more concerned about the pathophysiology of that cardiac ejection fraction and all those things. But it's not your only way of framing situations. And so we become habituated. Some people frame things in terms of the pharmacolo pharmacological management of disease. Some people use Maslow's hierarchy. Some people use the DSM-3 or 4 or 5. Some some people use the World Health International Classification of Disease. Some use classification of function, disability, and health. Some use NANDA, NIC, and NOC, North American Nursing Diagnosis Association, Nursing Intervention Classification System, Nursing Outcome Classification System. And sometimes you frame things unconsciously by the policies, the procedures, and the assessment form that you use. So for example, I'm absolutely shocked that at a hospital here in town, their nursing assessment form is a head-to-toe body systems assessment. What kind of frame is that? Pathophysiology, body systems. There's not a nursing ounce of nursing knowledge in there. Yes or no? Functional, dysfunctional? Alteration in or not? You know, so you, you kind of are seduced sometimes by the policies and procedures and the forms and the systems that you use. And that can become very dangerous. Even the electronic yeah. Yeah. Huge. Huge, huge, huge. Where is the nursing no knowledge? knowledge in there. Yeah, no nursing knowledge and now procedures right. and medical orders. Huge, huge subterfuge. Yeah, we're being sabotaged. <laughs> Seriously. Right. So what are the effects of framing? Well, first of all, it gives you this discipline-specific attention to phenomena. Frames help you figure out what your methodology is in terms of research. Conceptual frameworks or theories kind of provide a, a way to process information, policies and procedures. People can have competing frames of reference. So how are we going to get interprofessional health education when the physician is looking at the pathophysiology, the physical therapist is looking at function, the social worker is concerned about the system dynamics, the nurse is concerned about the human response to actual or potential health problems, the psychologist is interested in coping, so I do believe that these competing frames of reference is going to make it very difficult for us unless we can develop a meta frame that everybody can participate in and is all inclusive and transcends and includes ways to talk about our different disciplinary perspectives. And I have some ideas about that actually. Um, so people have a favorite knowledge classification system. How you see the world and perhaps your role in it contributes uh, in a, a given context. So frames, framing effects. What else do we say here? Here's some frames. Patient education, right? You say that, poof, a whole set of neural networks and mental models poof, just comes right forward based on your experience. Coping assistance, drug management, perioperative care, risk management, lifespan development, preterm labor, peaceful death, caregiver role strain, parenting, Non-compliant patient, acting out, you have a frame for that. Novice to expert, we have a frame for that. It has some meaning, constellates meaning. Critical thinking, we have a frame for that, but we've not done a very good job of making that very explicit. So the challenge here is, um, I love this quote, 
Representation and reasoning go hand in hand. How you represent the knowledge you use will influence the way that you reason about that. It is crucial, 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 crucial. And so um, I'll make these slides available. You can go and click on that um, later on. So Joanne on our quest to try and Joanne and I on our quest to try and figure out well, what is clinical reasoning and nursing, we went way back in the literature and kind of looked around and sort of did these you know investigations and oh sorry lost you I don't know who that was. Thank you. <clears throat> and. Uh, I think they said it was maybe Amy Wonder was going to, oh, you're going to just read dial up. So how many people uh, here uh, were born before 1950? <laughs> Do we have to raise our hand? Okay, so before 1950, folks, there was no such thing as the nursing process. Imagine that. Right? Nursing process language and terminology came along in the early 50s with, a, with a, an article by Faye McCain about assessment. R. Faye McCain. R. Faye McCain, yes. University of Michigan. R. Faye McCain. And so interesting patterns kind of emerged. Joanne and I realized that there were different generations of the nursing process and that it had changed over time. And it seemed like they were in 20 year spans. So from 1950. <laughs> 1950 to 1970, you look in the literature, it's all about problems and process, right? How many people remember Faye Abdullah's 21 Nursing Problems? I remember that book, where she was just trying to identify the problems. And then Ura and Walsh came along and they said, oh, process, we can structure the clinical thinking of nursing now in a very scientific way, given the context, 1953, Sputnik, boom, big science. People are now trying to kind of do the scientific thing, Structuring clinical thinking of nursing with science, scientific process, and API came along, right? Assess, plan, implement, and evaluate, right? So then, 1970, actually 70 to 90, another generation. So I call this first 1950-1970 problems to process first generation nursing process. 1970 to 1990 is second generation nursing process. Because in 1973 in St. Louis, a group of staff nurses got together and they said, you know what? This is crazy that we have so much uh, uh, lack of standardization and redundancy in the things that we do to take care of people. We ought to start collecting this and classifying it. So North American Nursing Diagnosis Association was born by staff nurses who were smart enough to recognize patterns and redundancies and no systematic way to, to inform and organize this nomenclature. So NANDA emerged 1973. Then the big debate was, do nurses diagnose? A lot of literature about nurses don't diagnose, nurses do diagnose, nurses diagnose within their domain of practice, nurses diagnose by virtue of their education. And then Tanner and Carnivelli and all those people, diagnostic reasoning, what's involved in diagnostic reasoning? Generating hypotheses, doing all kinds of things, coming to conclusions, thinking like a nurse, thinking like a nurse. 1984, Benner comes along, well wait a minute, there's other things here about nursing, novice to expert, novices, experts, and there's teaching, coaching, function, all kinds of different domains. So second generation was all about this diagnostic reasoning process and a lot of research about how people think and think about their thinking. And then uh, the nursing process changed, right? It went from a four-step process, American Nurses Association standards, to five steps. We were no longer API, we were ADPI, assess, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate. Five-step process now. Then something very interesting happened in 1986. The healthcare shifted. The rules of the game changed in 1986 and people were not paying for problems anymore. They were paying for outcomes. They were paying for end results. DRGs came in. And so people were more interested in results than problems. And so the rules changed, but nurses didn't change their thinking along with that. They still use the nursing process, which is a problem-solving model, not an outcome specification model. So we were caught in the web of a first-order change and a second-order change. And so we think 
1990 to 2012, here we are today, right? This is the third generation of nursing process, outcome specification and testing. And actually, if you go to the ANA website today, it's a seven step process now, right? Assess, assess, diagnose, outcome and planning process, implementation and evaluation. So the thinking and the nature of thinking in nursing has changed over time and it behooves us to change along with it. So um, that then led me to come to appreciate the nursing knowledge work. Clinical reasoning presupposes a clinical vocabulary. And this Nursing Information and Data Set Evaluation Center, which was developed long ago and far away, took all of the nursing knowledge classification systems that were going and evaluated them and put their imprimatur on them and said, if you are going to reason about nursing, if you are going to use nursing in your information systems, these are the approved ways to talk about nursing. <coughs> Nanda, Nick, Knox, so you can kind of click on there and go see all the approved nursing knowledge classification systems. So it's Nanda, Nick, Knock, the Omaha Home Health Nursing Classification System, Virginia Saba's Home Health Classification System, Alternative Link is one about complementary uh, therapies, and Patient Care Data Sets, the Nursing Minimum Management Data Set. Perioperative nurses even develop their own nursing knowledge classification system now, so that they have their own perioperative nursing data set. And all all of these have been kind of cross-referenced into something called SNOMED, Systematized Nomenclature of Medicine. And there are nursing terms in SNOMED language, and they are part now of the metathesaurus of the um, library of medicine. It's a done deal. Government approved, blessed, nursing knowledge in the metathesaurus. Of and then, of course, the ICNP, the International Classification of Nursing Practice, they're kind of moving. So not to, not to sort of leave off at the uh, third generation nursing process, this is my, this is Dan's mm -hmm. future projections uh, about what the next three generations of the nursing process are, because it doesn't stop here. So my belief is once nursing is in nursing information data sets and systems, and once we start aggregating and collecting all the nursing care knowledge associated with the patients that we take care of, that will be captured and we will move into a fourth generation of nursing process I call knowledge building, data mining, taking the knowledge that exists in the hospital information systems and analyzing the patterns of care, the nursing diagnoses, interventions and outcomes associated with the 10,000 hip replacements we did last year, or the 50,000 C-sections we did, or the 20,000 cardiac caths we did, or the motor vehicle traumas. And we will then be able to take that information and build it and mine it and recognize patterns. And that will then lead us to the next generation of the nursing process, once we have all this aggregated data, we can kind of be, uh, uh, use a lot of statistics like Bayesian statistic thinking, and we'll have an epidemiology of nursing diagnosis, and an epidemiology of nursing interventions, and an epidemiology of outcomes. And we'll be able to say, well, you know, X percent of the people who had this nursing diagnosis did this in X percent of time, and this was their length of stay. And so we'll develop these models and archetypes of care associated with the epidemiology of the nursing knowledge that we've collected and collated. And our DMP students, our nursing informatics students will help us, help us do this. And then by 2040 or 2050, we could have all of these algorithms associated with real live empirical data that we could input all of the individual idiosyncratic personalized things associated with a person and predict the kind of nursing care they need. So predictive care. I will be 100 in 2050, so I don't know that I will see this come to be, but this is kind of how I imagine nursing has changed over time in terms of our clinical thinking and where it's going. So, clinical reasoning and judgment is basically answers to questions about relationships among problems, outcomes, and interventions, and judgments about the nursing care somebody uses or thinks about to move someone from a present state, where they are now, to a desired state. I don't like to use the word problem, because what if somebody's healthy and well, and they want to get 
weller, more healthy, so that you don't want to use problem orientation. You want to kind of start where they're at in terms of health and take them beyond to where they need to go. And so there are lots of different logics that you have to kind of weave together here in terms of uh, nursing, thinking about this clinical reasoning, right? So there's the logic of the diagnosis. You've got to help students figure out what is the diagnosis here, the nursing diagnosis. Then there's the logic of the relationships among competing diagnoses and outcomes. See, there's that squiggle sense again. For every diagnosis, there is a complementary pair of an outcome. So, my experience has been, if someone has pain, oftentimes I hear students are asked, what's the outcome you want? And the student very naively will say, well, no pain. And that is not a complementary pair. And so, a fatal flaw that most of us use, and I've been guilty of it myself, is that we think outcomes are the negative definitions of the problem state. And that's not true. So you say infection? No infection. Suicidal ideation? No suicidal ideation. Anxiety? No anxiety. Well, you could be dead. No anxiety, no infection, no suicidal ideation. Nothing, dead. And so, you know, we've got we've to let go of that notion that outcomes are the negative definition of the problem state because it's not helping us move forward and it's not helping people reason effectively. So there is this complementary nature between a problem and outcome. So it's pain or comfort, pain or pain control, anxiety, anxiety control, fear, fear control, suicidal ideation, will to live, right? There is a complementary nature and nursing process only helps us look at the problem space. It does not help us look at the outcome space. Even though we now have that as a standard, we have not done that well. And we are all living with 50 years of education and unconscious models about problem solving as our mode of operation and influence. And so you've got to figure out then the logic of the intervention. Well, what will get us from here to there? If I look, think about the present state and the desired state in the same frame. And then you've got this logic of patterns and relationships between and among all kinds of things uh, and outcomes. And then there's the logic of clinical judgment. I think there are five C's to a clinical judgment. And then there's the logic of managing and monitoring yourself. So that gets at that notion of reflection, reflection in action, reflection on action, reflection beyond action in regards to where people go. So, uh, uh, through many, 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 many <laughs> case studies, trial and error, and all kinds of uh, creative insights, Joanna and I developed this meta model of clinical reasoning. Um, and uh, these are some of the essential elements of it. Uh, decision making, judgment, there should be one more framing and reframing. And uh, the reason we developed this, it starts with the patient story, is because we would give assignments to students with patient assignment, right? And this is their diagnosis, appendectomy. You have Mr. Jones, appendectomy. He's in 450 in the East Tower. Students would immediately go home. They'd get their assignment the day before. They would go home. They would put out all of their nursing diagnosis, intervention, and outcome books. Dunges was the probably most famous one there. And they would look up, oh, appendectomy. Okay, these are the nursing diagnoses. These are the interventions. And they would come back and they would have their care plan already done without ever talking to the patient. That drove me nuts. <laughs> And so I would always say, that's really interesting. I'm glad you did your knowledge work and that you've got these major terms down now, but I want you now to go talk Mr. Jones and see what his story is. And then you come back and talk with me and we'll talk about the story together. And so they would go, and of course, you know, what the book says and what Mr. Jones' concern were, were like <laughs> way far apart. Um, and so uh, it all starts with the story. It also starts with this framing and the knowledge representation. And are you aware of being aware of how you are thinking about this and framing this? Are you talking about the, the disease pathophysiology, the appendectomy and what that means? Are you talking about anxiety and coping? Are you talking about human responses? Framing and knowledge representations are crucial. Reflection and self-regulated learning. Um, there's, um, I have a good colleague, a doctoral student of mine, Ruth Ann Kuyper, has done a lot of research on self-regulated learning where she kind of gives people prompts to fill in the blank to kind of stimulate that reflection. 
concurrent information processing. When Joanne and I were working together, we worked with an engineer and he told us about concurrent information processing. We said, well, what's that? And he said, well, it's kind of, he wanted to do a chip for Intel, you know, where you would input data and it would automatically update all the cells in the matrix. And we said, well, that's what nurses do. <laughs> you go into a room and boom, you're updating cells. You're kind of taking in all kinds, of, and you're updating. So you're constantly engaged in this concurrent information processing. And then uh, it's not just critical, it's creative thinking because it takes a little creativity to figure out what the opposite of a problem is. And it's not just um, critical, it's systems because, you know, patients have more than one problem and these problems bombard and intersect and relate to each other. So which one's going to be the most significant problem that you're going to identify that might leverage the whole system? You're going to do 12 care plans on 12 problems or are you going to look at the problems and their relationships to each other and figure out where the center of gravity is? And what is that keystone issue that holds everything together? If you fix that, you fix everything else. And it's a cascading effect. And of course, we needed to focus on outcome specification. Testing, a test in our model is just the difference between a present state and a desired state. There's a gap there. There's a test of some type. And then you have to make a decision of what intervention you're going to use to bring someone to that desired state. And then you have to have some judgment about whether or not you achieve the outcome that you've set up for yourself. So that's the big <coughs> scheme of things. And this is our very academic definition. So uh, we believe that uh, clinical reasoning is reflective, concurrent, creative, critical systems and complexity thinking embedded in practice, used to frame, juxtapose, juxtapose is just side-by-side -side comparison, right? Present state, desired state, problem, outcome. Test and make judgments about present state transitions to outcome state targets. It's a mouthful. And this is what it looks like in our world. <laughs> so just stare at that a minute and see what happens. Anybody notice anything? Hierarchy. Hierarchy? What, what else? Any? You don't have anything on the vertical, on the vertical pulse. There's nothing. Yeah, what else? The change is on perspective. Say more, Phyllis. <laughs> no, I mean, it can go this way or this way, but as you look at it, it's a, a size change. Changes. It flips. Yeah. Foreground, background, uh -huh. yeah. oscillation, complementary pair, right brain, left brain, boom, boom. Your clinical gaze, the more you stare at it, the foreground will fade into the background and the background will come forward to the foreground and it's kind of like that uh, illusion of the old woman, young woman, kind of with the feather in their hat or the duck rabbit, you know, is it a duck or is it a rabbit? You remember in philosophy, those? So it's complicated bottom line. And this is how, uh, it, this is the structure we created. So that we start with a client story. Uh, we have a teaching learning tool which helps students map the complexity of the relationships between and among all of the different competing nursing diagnoses. They identify a keystone issue. They have to be clear about their framing, which is kind of in the background. They identify a present state, a desired state. And they figure out what nursing intervention they're going to use to get the person to the desired state and then they have a judgment about that and a judgment consists of five C's. The context, the um, context, the uh, outcome, right? What are the five C's? Context, story, contrast, present state, desired state concurrent criteria. What's the outcome associated with this? Concurrent consideration. How do I figure out how the intervention relates to movement from the present state to the desired state? And then a conclusion. We reached our target? Yes? No? Maybe? Think again. 
Is so. there a reason why you went right to left rather than left to right? Yep. I <laughs> figured. <laughs> yes, because, um, back up, clinical judgment is most important to me. Okay. Begin with the end in mind. Okay. The judgment is really what we're after. And as people have experience with this, and they have, you know, case after case, they are building schemas. They are laying down neural networks. They are creating neural semantic networks as well as uh, physiological kinds of things associated with their learning. And so um, this is this book here. I'll pass that around. You can pass that around. I love this book because it talks about the neurophysiological base and the motivational base. Uh, and um, learning is the product of working memory allocation. Working memory's capacity for allocation is affected by prior knowledge. If students don't have knowledge, if they don't have the clinical vocabulary, the words to describe the phenomena, they are sucking wind. And when students would show up and not be able to articulate what the knowledge was in a certain situation, I'd send them away. I said, you need to do the knowledge work associated with this case and then come back. Because you can't combine in new and different ways things you don't already have. Working memory is di directly affected by motivation. Uh, new learning requires attention. It requires repetition. It requires connections. And some learning is effortless, and some requires effort, right? And learning is learning, <laughs> these guys say. So um, one of the things that we discovered is that there are more ways to talk about thinking than critical. I love the definition of critical thinking by Fascione and Fascione, purposeful self-regulatory judgment. But the reality is, is that other people have studied thinking for a long time, and there are all these different language, languaging effects about thinking. So you can talk about a thinking process, examine, justify, elaborate, reflect, and for a product, theory, hypothesis, summary, deduction, a guess, a stance. A thinking stance would be agreement, disagreement, question, uh, doubt, dispute, or a state. Confusion, <laughs> awe, wonder, overwhelmed. So I think there's a need for all of us to expand our language and representation of the different dimensions of thinking associated with this. Here's my little guy. So here is what I think thinking and clinical reasoning is all about. First of all, cognitive, and that's I'm equating that with critical thinking. So you have to have the information on board. Kitchener and King talked about three levels of thinking. Uh, first level is cognitive, second level is metacognitive, third le level is epistemic <coughs> in terms of, cognitive is what you input in terms of knowledge. It's like memorizing, memorizing and learning the language. Metacognitive is what's the strategy you use to do that memorization and how do you combine those things together in a different way. Epistemic cognition is really kind of the higher order, really kind of hits you in doctoral work in terms of, Oh my God, I don't know what I don't know, and there's so many things to know, and what are the ethics of knowing, and what are the ethics of not knowing, and what's beyond knowing, and so it's kind of like way up here. So these are the essential elements, I think, of what clinical reasoning is. Cognitive, you have to have it on board. Metacognitive, you have to be able to be reflect on it. Creative, you've got to figure out this complementary tension between a problem and an outcome. And that's where your creativity comes in, right? It's, you've got to be able to combine that. Systems, when you've got one person with a, a medical condition and 15 nursing diagnoses, they are all interacting and relating each one to the other, and you've got to figure out how they impact. It's kind of like, how did this, how, what, what sense do you make out of this? So you have to have this systems thing about balancing and reinforcing loops and if you put something here what's gonna if you open the stock here what's gonna flow out here and what's gonna be you know uh, uh, managed over there and then complexity which is really about pattern recognition right and the patterns of all of this so here's how I see it <laughs> uh, different kinds of thinking each related to problems interventions and outcomes, right? Critical thinking, you've got to name and select. Creative thinking, you've got to figure out how to uh, 
identify and individualize and manage this problem outcome tension and synthesize the problem and the intervention. Systems, you've got to look at the balancing and reinforcing loops. Complexity, set of integrated relational dynamics over time. You know, while we want to pay attention to the individual nature of a condition, fact is if you have six, six or eight OB patients on a unit, they're going to have some similar problems and they're going to, you know, need to recognize those patterns. And when we get down here to predictive, I think we're a little far off. That takes us into the 2040 when we have our epidemiology of problems, interventions, and outcomes. We might be able to be predictive. So uh, Schaefer and Rubenfeld, you know, did this big consensus statement about critical thinking in 2002. Joanne and I were actually a part of their Delphi study in regards to this. And so there's, it's a great definition about critical thinking uh, and habits of mind. And it's all about analyzing, applying, discriminating, informing, logical reasoning, and transforming knowledge. But I think we need to add this layer on top of things, systems thinking. Um, because by taking the systems approach, you kind of understand the balcony view and you kind of can really see the bigger picture and what do the AAC essentials say now about systems thinking and master's programs and DMP people? Our DMP people are getting a heavy dose of systems thinking in the knowledge complexity course that I teach and the one that Julie teaches. Uh, and you understand the whole by understanding the interactions between all of these things, right? And complexity is, I think, transcends and includes systems thinking. And actually, I've been studying something more, most recently, integral theory, which transcends and includes complexity thinking. So um, uh, there's always more to learn. So let me walk you through an example. Here is Mr. Johnson, our bilateral knee replacement surgery, right? And so he's got um, a condition, right? And oftentimes, this was hard. We got a lot of pushback from our colleagues and peers who said, you're not teaching people nursing because you're starting with a medical problem. You're starting with the appendectomy or the heart attack or the stroke or whatever. Well, we started there because that's where the students started, right? And that's what they were enculturated to do. Yes, you could think about this in a much different way, but the reality is if people have a healthcare condition and if nursing is indeed the diagnosis and treatment of human responses to that particular healthcare condition, then it behooves us to start with the condition. And then what happens is you have to think, okay, how am I going to represent this? What's the clinical vocabulary I'm going to use to kind of talk about this? And what are the consequences or the human responses associated with this particular condition? And then how do I begin to look at the system dynamics and relationships among those things? Well, it's a web. It's a web. So, Mr. Johnson, we put the total knee replacement. This is a teaching learning tool we developed. It's called a clinical reasoning web. Mr. Johnson, we know the story, right? Although I didn't give you all the gory detail. Bilateral knee. And so the students say, okay, we have a knee, re total knee replacement. What are some of the actual or potential human responses to this? And in Mr. Johnson's case, pain, anxiety, risk for injury, risk for infection, knowledge deficit, impaired physical mobility, activity intolerance. So we ask ourselves, reflection, internal auditory dialogue, self-talk, what are the nursing care consequences associated with this? And somebody comes up with maybe a few more. Well, there might be body image disturbance, fluid volume deficit, self-care deficit, um, fatigue, right? So we're now just beginning to look at the problem, the nursing care consequences, and now we take it one step further and we ask, okay, how are these related to each other? What is the proposition that holds these together? And so what are the nursing care consequences? What are the human responses? What relationships emerge between and among the nursing care needs in this given situation? And this is clinical reasoning. <laughs> How is blank related to blank? So how is anxiety related to pain? What's the relationship or the proposition? Well, how do you give voice to that? What is your sense making, your explanatory model? Think out loud for me in relationship to that. If it's related, how is it related and in what ways? And if then, since so. If then, since so. And now what? 
So, learning is about connections. Learning is about repetition. Learning is about iteration. So, self-talk learning prompts. This is Ruth Ann Kuyper's work. Blank, blank is related positively to because since blank is related to blank, this means you get students to engage in hypothetical deductive thinking, propositional thinking, the logic of sense making. You give them some little scaffolds to kind of uh, put the ideas and thoughts together. It doesn't take very long before they get it. The greater the pain, the less the anxiety. The greater the pain, the comfort, maybe the more mobility. So we're getting students to connect the dots and we're giving them scaffolds. So, Mr. Johnson here, we get, oh, well, let's see, this is related to this, that's related to this, acute pain's related to fatigue. It's just a process of iteration. We help students get this sometimes by putting them into groups because some students are smarter than others and <laughs> got the knowledge on board and they help each other and they, you know, and the biggest complaint I get is, oh God, this is so messy. <laughs> Well, it does get messy. And then some students get so elaborate and they get color coded. They color code their stuff and they link things together with color coding and, and, and all sorts of things. And so they do this iteration. And there's a very interesting thing in systems uh, theory about a phase shift. And basically the bottom line is if you have two points and you iterate those two points with two or more points over a period of time and you iterate, 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 that entire system will undergo a phase shift and it will become something that it wasn't. And so a phase shift happens when students begin to iterate and start connecting the dots between pain, self-care, deficit, fluid volume, risk for injury, fatigue, activity and talks. And what happens is almost magic, <laughs> but the arrows converge on a particular diagnosis. It's a keystone issue, right? And then you begin to think, oh, if I fix that, oh my God, I fixed everything else. The keystone issue is the center of gravity that holds this system dynamic of the causal reinforcing loops together. And so that becomes your present state. So you do these concurrent reflections and iterations and now we think, oh my gosh, fancy that. There is a significant relationship between pain, fatigue, and impaired physical mobility. Sounds like a little middle range theory to me, but getting students to connect the dots and say how fatigue is related to impaired physical mobility and what the impact of pain is on that <laughs> is clinical reasoning in my mind. You're getting them to connect the dots in a new and different way and looking at it from a systems perspective. And that becomes what we call the keystone issue. And I got this notion of keystone actually when I was visiting Indianapolis in the Children's Museum on the second floor. <laughs> yeah, what did you do? Yeah, say. They have all these big blocks. Yeah. And they're, they're numbered for the kids, one through seven, I think. Mm -hmm. And they, the whole idea is to form an arch, but for them to cooperate with each other. Because they quickly learn yeah, when you get to a certain it. point, you need someone taller, you need to hold this or it will fall down before you get the keystone in. And there is a keystone. You put that keystone in this centenary arch and the whole thing stands. It's because it's the central supporting element. And there is a central supporting element in every patient care situation in regards to this. So then you juxtapose, right? Okay, acute pain, hmm, what do I want? No pain? No, that's not going to help Mr. Johnson. Maybe comfort, maybe pain control. So you've got this present state, desired state. And so you understand the tension here of opposites. Requires creative thinking. Another whole process altogether, taking the problem and turning it inside out and figure out what's on the other side of that coin. And there are all these great linkages here, Nanda, Nick, and Knock linkages. So for every Nanda diagnosis, there is a complementary pair Knock outcome. And the Nick will be what helps you get the patient from the problem state to the, to the desired state. So let's see. I could do this a couple of ways. Um, so would you help the student reason about uh, one more, I guess that's it. Uh, my experience has been that in the olden days, 
we would have used nursing process and focused on the problem side of this element. So that we would have been concerned about pain, anxiety, impaired physical mobility, self-care deficit, activity intolerance, fatigue, risk for infection, injury, and knowledge deficit. But what we're really interested in, in an outcome specification and testing world, are these things. We really want comfort. We want anxiety control. We want joint movement. We want self-care. We want ambulation. We want endurance. We want energy management. We want risk control. We want him to have knowledge of his treatment regimen. We want both and. We want this complementary pair of outcomes and problems put together in regards to that. So, you could either reason about this situation, framing it in a problem-oriented way. The greater the pain, the more fatigue, activity intolerance, and impaired physical mobility. That certainly is one way to explain and reason about this situation. But you could also frame it this way. Increasing comfort and pain control is likely to promote active joint movement, ambulation, and energy endurance. Which language are you going to use? Which frame are you going to use? Are you going to be problem-oriented or outcome-oriented? Or are you going to be pay attention to both at the same time? And do you teach the students to focus on problems, or do you teach the students to focus on outcomes, or do you teach the students about the relationship between a problem and an outcome? So, and we don't have to go very far because the knock people have done a great job of identifying all these wonderful nursing outcomes. So much so that other disciplines in other parts of the world and other countries are using the knock outcomes to, to describe their practice. So here's, so if we want comfort, which is our desired goal here, uh, this is a knock outcome. It's uh, numbered 2100 because eventually someday it will be right in that information system. We'll be able to extract it. We'll be able to bill for it. We'll be able to, you know, kind of use the nursing information system, knowledge modeling and building and mine it. Here's the definition. The people at Iowa spent 30 years developing <laughs> Nandis, Nixon, Knox. 30 years, over 30 years, and they've got great, great resources on the Clinical Effectiveness Research Center there. So, positive perception of physical, psychological ease, outcome, rating, maintain, but clinical indicators, even those are numbered, interestingly enough. On a scale, how would you rate this in terms of judgment, one to five? And then NICS, oh my God, here we go. NICS, 43 activities. How are we gonna decide? What, what decisions are we gonna make in relationship to which of these 43 activities in the NICS uh, pain management intervention, number 1400, are gonna suit our person with our story in our particular situation? There's a degree of clinical decision making that comes here with, oh, you know, if someone is, um, you know, uh, I forget what. If someone is paralyzed, you may not want to do some things with them that require physical mobility, <laughs> right? So, um, so here is the op model worksheet that we developed as a result of our model. And so we say the OPT model is, provides the structure for Nanda, Nick, and Knock language, right? So that the um, the keystone issue is the NANDA diagnosis, right? The knock outcome is the outcome state associated with it. It's the juxtaposition, pain and comfort. The NIC indicators are a part of the criteria used for outcome specification here. The targets are related to outcome specification in regards to that. And testing, you know, as you use NIC interventions and you kind of make decisions about what's going to move the patient here, uh, that will help you kind of achieve the outcome state and then hopefully you'll get here to a judgment. Contrast, pain, comfort, criteria, knock, knock indicators. Concurrent consideration. If I use these NIC interventions, will I get this knock outcome at this particular criteria? Conclusion. Did I get it or not? If I did, great. If I didn't, think again. <laughs> Reframe. Maybe it's not the right outcome. So you can do the same kind of thing with 
the um, knock outcomes and the NIC interventions. Lo and behold, how are the interventions related? And is there a keystone issue associated with this clustering of interventions and the system dynamic loops associated here? And you look at the arrows and students are iterating, iterating, and by God, if it isn't drug management, <laughs> drug management, physical comfort promotion helps manage and leverage this situation. Uh, maybe you'd want to do risk management, maybe you'd want to do information, maybe you want to do health systems mediation, but it's not going to get you the bang for your buck in terms of its effect in regards to this. So decision making in this model is the choice of an intervention that supports and influences transitions from a present to a desired outcome state. And testing is the concurrent thinking about present state transition to outcome state targets. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? The test, you set up the test between the present state and the desired state, and then you do the interventions and you test, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So somebody with COPD comes into the ER and their PO2 is like 75, and you do all of the great things about getting that person up to speed, you know, raise their head and give them the oxygen and all that, and then your PO2 is now 82. And you think, well, I better do some more things. You do some more things and finally get it up to 80. Six, and then you kind of go back and say, well, it's just not getting up there. And you go back and reframe the situation, come to find out he's never had a PO2 above 86. <laughs> so what is your conclusion there? How are you framing and reframing that situation after you reflect on this particular situation? And so this is the judgment then, conclusions derived from the test. So here are my five C's. Uh, context and client story. Contrast, present state, desired state. Criteria, effective evidence, clinical indicators, rating scales, target ratings. You're, a lot depends here on your framing and your knowledge representation. If you don't have it, you're in trouble. <laughs> Concurrent thinking, how is the problem, outcome, and intervention all related as I update my cells and I do this in my scene transitions from one state to the next? And then a conclusion, yes, I've met my target, no, ratings and targets not achieved yet, uh, or maybe think again, reflect something else is going on here that I haven't taken into consideration. So, clinical teaching, optimizing the teaching learning of clinical reasoning. Uh, tell me the story. <laughs> I always start with tell me the story. And actually, I sort of develop what I call clinical reasoning caricature. As students are telling me stories, I put the thing in the middle and I draw the story out. I kind of work with them to kind of map out what the things are. So tell me the story. And then I say, well, how are you framing this situation? So if it's just all about the pathophysiology of the heart and the ejection fraction associated with the sodium transporting across the membrane and the PO, the, you know, the, it's clear to me they're framing this in a pathophysiology model and not looking beyond the physiology to what the human response is. And maybe it's because they don't have the language. Maybe it's because they haven't done the knowledge work. Maybe they're not aware of Nanda, Nick, and Nock. Maybe the electronic health record is only interested in blood values and normal values and what that means and so they don't even that doesn't even cross their screen and their radar how are you framing that what diagnoses have you generated nursing diagnoses these are nursing diagnoses and you can get as granular as you want well how do you know that's a diagnosis you can kind of take them back to the old man of days what are the cues you're paying attention to what's the evidence how are you clustering those cues you can really get them to go really nitty-gritty if you want what outcomes do you have in mind given the diagnosis? Life is bipolar. Everything contains its opposite. So if it's pain, then the opposite of pain is comfort. If it's suicidal ideation, the opposite is will to live. So how are you thinking about the complementary nature of the problems and outcomes? Whoops. What evidence supports those diagnoses? So you can kind of get them to be more specific in terms of their observations. How does a reasoning web reveal the relationships between and among all the identified problems? Systems view, balcony view, what are the causal reinforcing loops associated with this? What keystone issue emerges? How is the present state being defined? Uh, what are your desired outcomes? 
what's the gaps or the complementary pairs of outcomes and present states? Let's think about this for a minute. Let, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, what are the clinical indicators of the desired outcome? Got to have knowledge on board if you don't know clinical indicators for outcomes achieved. So, so in my world, we should be teaching everybody, Nanda, Nick, and Nock, <laughs> not just one, because you only have a third of the story if you just got Nanda, and you don't know what you're going to do to get people to a Nock. Uh, on what scale will the desired outcome be rated, and how will you know when the desired targeted outcome is achieved? And then, uh, what clinical decisions or interventions help you with this situation? What specific interventions will you implement? Why are you considering those? Tell me more. Uh, how are you defining your testing, concurrent thinking and consideration about the present transition to outcome state targets in this particular case? Given your testing, what is your clinical judgment? Based on your judgment, have you achieved the outcome or do you need to reframe the situation? How specifically will you take this experience? This is very important. This is kind of like Chris Dreyfer's reflection beyond action. It's future pacing. Because, you know, if you have one case, there, it's like a hologram. A lot of cases are like that. But if you leave that case there in that unit on that day, and you don't think about that case as a potential um, exemplar in a pattern of relationships, you're not ever going to embed in them a little pre cognitive, predictive thing about, okay, so what will I take with, what will I take with me from today that I can use in the future about these particular kinds of situations? You know, you labeled this clinical teaching, and I'm thinking this would be a great thing, especially for new faculty, on how you, you're not teaching them, you're questioning with all of this. Mm -hmm. So I, I would almost want to say that, you know, you know, the, the word teaching here is like, I mean, I love this fact of how we can go and question. Inquiry. Yeah. Inquiry? Yeah. Or better yet might be to put clinical teaching tilde learning. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Tilde learning because it's a complementary pair. It's a Socratic method. Mm -hmm. It's a Socratic method with um, an, an outline and intention in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we're back to this uh, unified learning model. It requires attention, requires repetition, it's about connections. Some learning is effortless, some requires effort, and learning is learning. So um, we have some challenges ahead of us because, um, you know, I have been all over the country. <laughs> teaching this model. They used this model actually was one of the first models they used at the University of Portland and they transferred the model into the dedicated education units in Oregon. So they used the model there. They used the model at the University of Arizona. They're using this model in DMP programs in Southern California. They use this model in Florida. They use this model in Iowa. Uh, this structure also can be used with graduate students to help them figure out how to develop a middle range theory about a phenomena of concern to them and to even maybe begin to test middle range theory wise relationships between Nanda's, Nix, and Knox. But we are fighting an uphill battle because our management information systems that don't include this information in it. Or they, they have the option of buying a nursing information system module, but they don't. And so meanwhile, nurses are doing head to toe, body systems, thinking pathophysiology, nursing. They're only implementing the medical regimen. Right. I see virtually, I, I see so little nursing care happening in hospitals today, it just makes me sick. It's because we're not framing it or <laughs> representing it in terms of the and system. Even looking at the screen mm -hmm. and never looking at the patient, asking questions so they can stay in front of the screen and check off boxes. Maybe go over and give the meds. Forced framing. And touch the patient for a minute just to get their ID band. And once the medication's delivered, they're they're out the door and there's nothing else happening. Right. It's scary. It is scary. It's really scary. We're going the opposite direction. Yeah, we are. It's pretty sad. So um, we need leadership for change to bring these things about. And it is complex. Um, and we need people who can develop an innovation and creativity associated with this. And 
And so um, these are my knowledge work questions. I kind of use these to structure my post in my forum because I figure I find that if I don't give them some guidance they um, have stream of consciousness <laughs> and they write pages and pages. So I ask them and I will ask you now to give a little thought to what concepts, ideas, tools or techniques or resources did you think were most useful about this presentation? How do you think this information can be used? Why do you think it's important and then why care? Yeah, having taught for a long, long time and seeing where students are now, one of the things I think is reflection. That's a key thing to it all. Because students, I think, sometimes have the knowledge. They just don't know what to do with the knowledge. And I really like, because some of the work that I've kind of been looking at is on Kolb and is it Shone or Stone, however Donald. you say. Yeah, Mr. Donald. Mm -hmm. And you look at that, and it fits along with what Chris is doing. And I didn't realize all this kind of fits together, but thinking about my students now and looking at how the focus has been on interprofessional education, I can tell you I can't quantify it, I don't know because I haven't done a study, but there's something different about the mindset now that, and I agree what you're saying, but I'm seeing a difference between the reflection, we're working together better, and just the critical care areas that I have my students there's more of that dialoguing going on between the physicians, the student nurses, and the staff. Mm -hmm. And so I think a key link is learning with, from, and about each other. Mm -hmm. And you're right, this is nursing. And, and I'm thinking, I'm one of them that kind of kicked out Nick, Nanda, Nick, and Nock. <laughs> I meant it. Um, because students were getting so caught up in to giving me this perfect paper, and they could have an A-plus paper oh, this is great, but you dialogue with them, they had no idea what they would written on that perfect piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So the key link, I think, is your voice, <coughs> the patient's story. I always say, tell me your patient's story today. I didn't even realize I was doing the right thing. I've done that for years. <laughs> it's kind of how me, because I'm that right. type person. Well, that's how you learn. Now the students are saying, let me tell the story. It's mm -hmm. really kind of neat. The narrative. But I still believe, Leslie, too, it's been simulation and interprofessional that has been bringing about the key link. Yeah. Because in simulation, they they go in and they work together and then they reflect on their thinking and it's making a difference significantly in clinical. I don't have data to support it, you're right, mm -hmm. data talks, but I can tell you there's a difference. My students that had simulation two weeks ago were so different in clinical and I've got another group doing simulation Wednesday and it's anx I'm anxious to see how they're going to look different next, the following week. Mm -hmm. Great, great comments. And it's with medicine and nursing. Right. Well, here's the deal with the op model. It is um, the only thing that makes it nursing is the language you use. That model, the meta model, could be used for medicine, mm -hmm. for occupational therapy, for physical therapy. It's the knowledge representation and the framing that makes it nursing. There's a study, Leslie, we could get students to do. I think that's really useful because it I'm pretty sure that we're, we're really committed to in, infiltrating undergraduate education with IPE in the sophomore, junior, and senior level. It, not just one little experience, not just a little simulation here and there, but I think it's, it's going really to be happening. I think in the next couple of years you're going to see that it, it's going to become a normal part part of how we work and some of it might not be related to a story around a patient but a lot of it will be how do you how do you work together otherwise I mean unless it's about a patient care situation well I, I think both faculty need a lot of work and in, in, in coming here and, and dialoguing over brown bags or whatever and, and how that information is getting across to students and I know I stopped teaching Nanda Nick and Nock because, for the most part, I mean, we teach them how to use it, but they were looking so hard to find a correct Nanda wording that they, they totally overlooked what the patient's problem really was, much less the story. I mean, it was just altered skin, but it didn't tell you where it was altered or how it was altered, but they were so intent on doing what the book said and coming up only with the interventions that they paid absolutely no attention 
to the patient's story mm -hmm. and what the patient wanted and what, mm -hmm. what level of comfort was acceptable to the patient. Mm -hmm. Now some patients do want zero pain, but that's not always a reasonable outcome to right. the pathology, which you have to also look at. Yeah. See, I'm also challenged with this, Nina, that you're not part of your discussion here, because I, I want the students to be able to go in and hear the patient's story and come up with those, you know, the, the nursing diagnosis that they see. Um, and, not, and, and they do, they focus on this book. So the question is, do we start with the book and then kind of level it off so that they can go in? Because they can come up with those things. On they the have book. to have they the language. Be, you know, the early students. Yeah, in, in South Carolina, what they did is they took some of, most of the um, common diagnoses associated with the clinical for that particular time, and they drilled the students about the, the vocabulary. It's like learning a vocabulary. It's like flashcards. It's that level one knowledge. You have got to know the language inside and out before you can apply it or use it. They need to have just a dedicated language course before they start. And the reality is uh, Phyllis has a copy of the first book over there. Nanda Nick at Knock wasn't even in existence when we did that book. And so what we did with that book is we showed how you could use the op model with lots of different classification systems. So it's Marjorie Gordon's functional health patterns, it's the Omaha home health system, it's the DSM, it's Nanda, and so we, yeah. It's, it's a very um, important philosophical commitment a faculty has to make to this notion about knowledge representation and what you're going to teach. And it's hard to make that commitment in a school with a curriculum if your partners in practice don't have it in their information system. <laughs> because then it becomes, oh, well, why do we don't use it here? We don't use it there. Or students learn it in the school and then get out and practice and people have, you know, got a standardized care plan based on body systems or something. I was wondering, Julie, what you think the reason, I as a patient go in and I hear exactly what you're, you know, they look at the screen the whole time and they don't think while they ask themselves they can check them. Um, I'm sure that with their workloads as heavy as they are, they're responding to prioritizing needs for, you know, forms to, and what, who is giving them, is it the, is it the nursing, not nursing, but hospital administration, or what's the cause of this? It's, it's not just that nursing, nurses wouldn't like to do the other. They are trying to make the best use of their time. Right? Who is setting up this way? Well, I think it, there's no question it's multi-causal. <coughs> you know, I think one of the biggest problems is that developers develop these EHRs, not clinicians. And so it takes so many clicks to get where they need to go to put what they need, want to put down. So the workflow of these systems are just horrendous. Right. I mean, just horrendous. Well, and back in the day, <coughs> you just take your chart with your lunch and go fill it out. Right. You know what I mean? You didn't have to do it right then right. because you it came with you and often an admission it was done either after you were done with your shift because it was so much paperwork or during while you were eating lunch. So but now you can't because you have to have it be in a certain spot to do it. And so that influences a lot. Well, interestingly what I've observed and this is all purely observational so, so I haven't done I think we need to study about this. It'd be fascinating but I observed when I was with my mother and she was, mm. the, the EHR and the screen is in the room and the keyboard's in the room. You see a lot of that phenomena going on where they're just dedicated to the screen and the keyboard and nothing else is happening except mm. medication administration. That's mm. pretty much it. Interestingly, we were with a friend whose baby was at Riley NICU and the, the EHR and keyboard were positioned right outside the room. Hmm. And I saw a very different phenomena. So a lot of it really relates to to just where is it positioned, you know, where is the data entry position, the workflow, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons that's happening. And know? outcomes and patient satisfaction will drive it every time. And you could be the worst of anything, but if you connect with that patient and family, right. you might get in trouble because your data is not caught. I mean, they. I mean, they no longer, they have to clock in and out for breaks and lunches because they stop that. So 
You're exactly right. At least what I'm seeing in, in the areas where I, I have like seven different floors, I have students, and it's all that that pressure that I've got to have those charts filled in, that little clipboard, and you're right. It takes 20 flips of that screen to get that you've got to get, and you've wasted all and this the time. And many times on, on certain things won't allow later Right. Mm -hmm. Or you get penalized because when they do the check right. and you are the red flag that right. comes up, then that's you're right. called to the office. That's Even right. though it's yep. supposedly mm -hmm. a systems problem, that's not what the staff is saying. Mm -hmm. So they're stressed. Right. So right. it all comes down to. It's interesting. You know, I have a link to. Uh, I have a link to an article about the importance of standardized nursing language in my D751 knowledge complexity class. So I have a lot of the DNP students saying, I, I went to my people in my organization, no one seems to be able to answer the question if we use standardized nursing language in our systems. I'm still searching for the answer to that question. It doesn't exist. So. St. Vincent's is the first to start putting nursing in and if not in mm -hmm. their system. But no, from what I understand, no other health system in this area includes. Right. What the community did? No. Nope. No. Nope, nope. mm -mm. They're the ones that. There's the. They're the ones that use the body head to toe systems. <laughs> I know. I was going to say because I keep our students. Yeah. Me no data for me, although um, thinking about teaching our students obviously is very important. In fact, Lori's been. We use a clinical web, but that being said, we realize how much more we could develop it. I think this has been phenomenal. For me, however, as selfish as they, this may sound, I need to change my thinking mm -hmm. first before, mm -hmm. although I can make some changes with the students and really learning as a faculty member and as an educator, how am I framing nursing education mm -hmm. and how am I framing my own thinking mm -hmm. about how I teach students and about how I approach. Um, so for me, it was more personal, and I just sat in Meg's office this morning, practically in tears, and I'm like, I can't figure out how to frame my study, because you know, they keep telling me, and I was like, I don't know what that means. What do they mean? What do they mean? Oh. And I could not sort it out in my head. <laughs> we had this talk to it, I'm like, I don't know what they want from me. Uh -huh. Tired, tired, tired. And uh -huh. then it's like, I wrote down, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's framing. It's framing. It's framing. It's, framing. it's yes. that's perfect. Yeah. How, the, how do you cluster yeah, the yeah, meaning? Yeah. yeah. Question: I was curious, how much of those models and so forth do you teach to the students undergrad, and how much do the faculty use them to uh, teaching it? When, when I first started here, I remember they were into systems theory. Uh, and they were trying to teach the in vogue. complexity of systems theory to the students and teach them all the terminology and everything. It was a total disaster. And finally, they decided that it's really useful for faculty to be using it, but you don't have to have the students memorize all the terminology. Well, I don't, think we I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I can see DMV, yeah. they would be using all it, but do you teach your under the full measures? One of the impetus for, for beginning this, what I sort of think of as a conversation that we'll have to have until we figure out wh where we're going is that I realize that we're really not, we're all over the board here. Yeah, yeah. Each class is doing, I don't know, its own <laughs> thing. And I mean, that might be okay. I don't think we have to always do the same thing, but we're not, we're not being, we're not doing any metacognition about how we're doing it. We're just sort of willy-nilly doing different things. And the students are, that's hard for the students. So are you recommending that these things be taught to the models? Well, I'm things? really just starting a conversation. Well, I mean, um, In a lot of places, they do use the model, and they do teach the language. Yes, I think it would be phenomenal. For example, at Iowa, they use this model for their um, master's level entry people, and they use the book. But at the University of Iowa Hospital, it's all computerized around Nanda, Nick, and Nock. So that, that's, you know, once I discovered that, that led me to the next three generations of the nursing process because they had an article about here were the nursing diagnosis of 10,000 hip replacements that we did. Here were the gaps. Here was the pattern. And there are certain things after you do that kind of analysis that you learn that you don't have to include that are redundant redundant and other things that you've missed in so terms of discharge planning. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's, the, that's the question that I have is this seems very higher order thinking and you know I've been with graduate students forever so you know is an 18 or 20 year old 
able to think this way. They could do that web quite well. But see, yeah, the sure. web, we and do they the do web. Like, okay. yeah. yeah. We need to be fine. Well, we've realized we need no, to add to it. They, they can. Yeah. Um, no, no. the phone connection just died. Well, I, I understand that Wilmington does use yes. this model, but I, know that they, I don't think they use Nanda and Nick and Knox. I don't think Nick and Knox, but we, when we first started the S-470, we had those students come down and having those students in clinical that were taught that thinking, I never had problems with their thinking process, but I never fully understood the OPT. Um, and at that time was when we went to the new curriculum and we did the Nick, the Nanda, Nick, and Knock. And then for several semesters, we used that, it made sense. But then it got somewhere lost along the line. So now when students come to me, I have 18 students now, and I can tell you there are probably six different ways to think about your thinking mm -hmm. to come up with it. And there's one individual, I'm going to mention her name, is, is Vima. I don't know what Vima does, but if they've had Vima, they somehow know how to do a nursing <laughs> diagnosis and it and knock and nail or whatever. Hmm. Well, she has to draw a picture. Because you know, you, she yeah. tells, they tell yeah, the story she, with a picture. Mm -hmm. Because they, those group of students that come from whatever that group is that's involved with that, they can do it. Mm -hmm. And one of them actually said to me, Shirley, this paper that I write, it's, I wish I could do my framing. And I said, go ahead. <laughs> you know, if that works, do my I frame. do it. I've heard it so far. Yeah. yeah. But she, and also, um, there's somebody else that was doing it, but they, but they, ha and the one group, it was one of my students, Robin, and it was really interesting because I thought, well, where did you learn that terminology? So, mm -hmm. You know, I think what would be really cool, I invite, I think I see several of you, that several of you aren't uh, involved in the bridge discussions, talking mm -hmm. about how we're going to start, how, how we can bridge from degree to degree, make mm -hmm. it so easy for someone to to mm -hmm. go from their undergrad here to their master's DMP or PhD. Mm -hmm. And we begin talking about the concept of clouds and what are what are the basic clouds? You know, like <clears throat> there's a there's a um, leadership cloud. <laughs> there's a um, ethics and policy cloud. There's a informatics cloud. Should be a clinical reasoning cloud. It's a clinical reasoning <laughs> cloud. But that you're getting to my point, I think it would just be so cool because I, I see this process being so applicable. So it, it's at the individual patient and across in patient population level when they're in undergrad. <clears throat> but I could see this working beautifully when they're doing um, organizational assessments. Yep. And putting together all the different dynamics of why things happen the way they do in mm -hmm. organizations that end up affecting patient care. So at the master's level, it would be... It supports the development of systems thinking. Systems thinking. Yeah. I mean, it just is the scaffolding and language. Mm -hmm. well, and I can say from the APN, that's the part that I'm having trouble with the students getting. Well, they're all practicing RNs, and they're used to not thinking that system relates to physiologic systems. Right. But now we're moving into this person in a bigger system. Right. right. They, oh my God, you would think that I was asking them to like, I don't know what, mm -hmm. be move on. But the part mm -hmm. that for us that I think we can do like immediately is the desired outcomes piece. Yeah. That's the yeah. piece that, Huge. that I keep, I can't, I couldn't figure out what was missing in so many of their just, they're charting, they're recording their blogs about telling their experiences. They're good about saying what happened, but not about what they want to happen. Mm -hmm. Just what they're, get there. there's no goal statement. It's just mm -hmm. diagnosis and plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In clinic, they don't get to evaluate, necessarily may not see the same patient mm -hmm. again. So they only get this like 20 minute experience, and then they move on to the next one. And they do get the pattern piece, mm -hmm. but the, the nursing piece is hard to articulate right. in APM. Mm -hmm. So is this available? Yeah, can be. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to Nikki, or you'll upload uh, it on. Send it to Nikki and I. Um, we sent out a few articles for you, and um, there were there a whole several. lot of other articles. That there were a whole lot of other. Public ten different things. Yeah. Which for the I don't know if she's yeah. going to put them out on BSN curriculum or she's going to. It's on the BSN curriculum because I don't have access to that, so I, I didn't see that in my on course. Yeah, we can put them in the Pearl. They can be in the Pearls. That's well. That'd be good. They can be in both places. But the impetus for today's talk was really in the BSN curriculum, although I'm glad it's of interest to other people as well. Um, 
I think it's just sort of, this is like the first step in what I think is going to be a conversation for a while until we, because un, until we all have talked about it enough that, that we know what we want to do, I sort of think that it's not that we have to only ever settle on one thing, but if we don't at least have thought about it and talked about it, I mean, even if we come up with two camps, we could talk about that with the students, right? Well, here is one really good way of working with this, and we'll do this. And then maybe in this other course, some different faculty want to look at it a different way. And they say, well, now I know you learned da-da-da, mm -hmm. but I'm going to take it and twist it, and I want to you know, mm -hmm. look at it this way and see what, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we can yeah. do that with our, our students are very, they're very bright. Mm -hmm. But if we haven't thought about what we're doing, they're not going to get mm -hmm. it. It's just haphazard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Really good. Thank you. Is this the end of the group? Yes. This is the end of the, I was going to see if we answered these questions, but I think we did. Mm -hmm. yeah, for the most part. Thank you. Do you see this point that's involved? Go ahead. When you were using that Socratic paragraph, I think that it was excellent, and that's how I teach it. But we're 